The second session for the nervous system is to do with concussion, compression, laceration, and brain abscess. So these are the things that we'll talk about in the second session. The second um, session, as I mentioned, these ones are, somebody says, very, very friendly um, conditions, especially the compression, concussion. But when you have a brain abscess, it can be fatal. So we'll start by talking about the, um, the compression, compression uh, concussion, and the lustration. The brain, as we have it, is very, very soft and spongy inside the skull. So if you have anything that is pressing on the skull, it can also affect the brain. Even though we have the skull, we also have what we call the protective structures of the brain and the spinal cord. So the one that is close to the bone is a dura mater. The one that is in between protective shield is arachnoid. And the one that is very, very near to the brain and the spinal cord is a pia mater. So these three um, structures, in addition to the bone itself, protect the delicate brain and the spinal cord. So um, these are things that I know that you have done during your uh, diploma training. So I also suggest that you go back, review your notes so that you can be abreast with the structures of the brain and the spinal cord. So the compression, concussion, laceration fall within the broad umbrella of head injury. So that is what we are going to talk about. And the injury can be penetrating, which is op open, or it can be just superficial, which is closed. So we talk about three major mechanisms that can uh, cause head injury or trauma. The first one is acceleration injury. And this occurs when the immobile head, like my head is here, and something comes to, I mean, hits my head, it's acceleration injury. Then the deceleration injury occurs when the head is moving and it hits a stationary object. So I am the one moving and I went and hit my head against the wall, something like that. Then the last one, which is deformation injury, or refers to injuries in which the force results in deformation or disruption of the integrity of the impacted body part. So that is, um, th these three terms are really not saying much. The important thing for you to know is that you can have a head injury that is just oh, a bump on the skull or an injury that really, really you have a, a broken bone or something piercing that badly. So the third one is just the, the severe type of um, head injury mechanism. Now, um, you can have the injury to the, to the bone, the skull bone itself, or you can have the injury on the scalp, the scalp, that is the, the skin around the head. You can have an injury and you have a sore on the scalp. And then you can have the concussion, compression, laceration, and the contusion, which we'll be talking about along the line in the presentation. So concussion, I said in the beginning, is friendly. It's a mild brain injury. So when there's a blow on the head, you know, um, you can have some swelling, you can have some emotional irregularity, but not much. And it doesn't have any serious effects, but sometimes in severe cases of concussion, you can forget easily. You can even forget things now or things that happened um, 10 years ago. So uh, concussion is, is not too, 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 somebody said, I should be afraid if you have a concussion. But then remember that somebody can have dizziness 
can also be depressed because of the con concussion. And also depends on the parts of the brain that was um, affected. So we'll be talking about the various parts and the key things that can happen to you if that part is affected. Then when you have a compression, the, that one occurs with pressure. So the first one, something hits you and kind of shakes the, 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 the brain a little, it's fine. That's concussion. Then compression, there's pressure on the brain, like something is pressing on something. So the names describe the problems as it is. So in that case, the person can become drowsy, may have difficulty breathing, weak pulse. Even a person can become paralyzed, depending on the parts involved. And sometimes headache, and then temperature uh, irregularities. Somebody can even become comatose because of severe pressure on the brain. Then the other friendly one is laceration. Laceration is just like a, a wound, a small bruise or something, a cut on the scalp. So once it affects the head, we call it head injury also. So you can have lacerations and this, you dress the wound aseptically until it heals. So if somebody has a head injury, any of the three, some of the general things that a person can show could be headache, vomiting, vision issues. You see, I love surgery so much because once you know something and you hold on to that knowledge, it takes you through the course. So if you are able to go through your cranial nerves well and know what they do, and therefore I have a problem with my head, some of these nerves are affected, you borrow from what the, the nerves can do to generate the problems that a person can manifest. So confusion, behavior, uh, loss of consciousness, temperature, restlessness, all those things, the cranial nerves have said it all already. Then we have to be able to diagnose a person with any of the problems we have discussed. So sometimes, we want to take the person for a scan, computerized tomography scan of the head, to be sure that there is nothing wrong as such, in quotes. For example, if there's a pressure on a part of the brain and you do a CT scan, it will give you that assurance that it is just the compression. Once the whatever is compressing is relieved, the person will be fine and there are no other issues. You can do an X-ray, an MRI, other blood tests, and lumbar puncture. You take the CSF. If there's bloody, then there's a person is bleeding into the, uh, the CSF. So you do these investigations to appreciate the magnitude of the problem the patient is having. How do we care for them as nurses? I have a bump on my head and I'm so anxious. What is happening to me? First of all, you have to speak to the person to relax the person, make the person uh, relax. Um, tell the person what you can do to help, you know. So if it's a laceration and I'm bleeding, of course, you arrest my hemorrhage, applying pressure. Lesson 337, we discuss how to control bleeding. So if I've forgotten, just go and pick that slide, read and move on. So if I've lost so much blood, of course, transfuse me so I can be alive. This again, if you have a patient whose religion doesn't allow transfusion, then you discuss other uh, approaches that you can use to help. But if there is an object that is stuck on my scalp, Please leave it there. When you go to theater, it will be removed and it can be helped. Any part of the body at all, you have a patient with an impacted object. We said that when we we're doing 333, talking about the chest and the, the, the trauma thereof. So you leave it in situ until the person goes to the theater and it's removed. Then you make sure the person rests and sleeps. 
and if there's any pain you relieve it you observe the sleeping pattern and if there's any restlessness any seizure you control it as we have discussed a moment ago in all these patients because of the restlessness you protect the sides of the bed so you know the bed is very small it's not like your bed in your house so you protect so the person will not fall and of course your prescribed medications and your input and output record now I've taken the trouble to give you some specific management for concussion, compression, laceration, etc. If I'm concussed, you apply co compress, you monitor my vital signs, you avoid unnecessary movements, etc. So um, you take a little time to also go through these specific management of the three, which are not very, very uh, difficult. But I want to spend a few minutes on the surgical aspects. What can we do as surgical nurses? For some of the patients, they have to do a craniotomy. So they open into the skull and solve the problem for you. So if you have uh, something stuck in the head or you have a very serious trauma, they have to do a craniotomy for you and do the surgery. Remember that if a patient is going for cranial surgery, you have to shave the hair. So the hair, all of it must go. And then if the person goes into the theater, the person comes back from the theater, you are going to nurse the person flat on the back. And usually the room should be a little darkened because we don't want to stimulate the person more and because of that we restrict visitors as much as possible so all of these must be explained to the uh, patient relatives so that they will not be very very alarmed you are going to do the neurological assessment as we have discussed for the patient before and after the surgery and when the person is lying down there in a very slightly darkened room we make sure that we still keep an eye on the vital signs. So some of them are connected to monitors, and so the monitor picks up these vital signs automatically. Um, along the line, we involve the physiotherapist so that the person will be able to um, expand the lungs. The chest is very, very critical for such patients. There are several complications that may arise when a person goes in for the craniotomy. And some of them, after the surgery, rather, the draconal pressure starts increasing. Some of them develop infections. Some of them become epileptics. I mentioned already that a person can become psychotic, delirium, confusion. So cranial surgery is a very, very delicate and um, important surgery that when a person is going in you must make sure that you assess the person critically to make sure the person is fit for the surgery and after the surgery you also nurse the person make sure your dressing is highly aseptic so that because when you have an infection of the brain it's a very serious problem so we don't want that to happen so make sure that you take care of that person very well then because if you um, you know when the hair is growing and you apply the plaster you are removing it, it's very very painful so mostly we bandage um, the, the head so that it will be easy to remove the dressing and dress the wound again so with that we come to brain abscess brain abscess is very serious sometimes the person cannot afford or the patient relative they cannot afford the very expensive antibiotics that we use for brain surgery brain abscess sometimes to depend if the abscess is localized the surgeon can go and drain the abscess for the patient but in all this we pray 
that uh, our patients do not get brain abscess because it's very, very difficult to treat. And sometimes you don't make it. So when you have a brain abscess patient on your ward, you should take care of that patient well. Some of them develop paralysis as part of the disease complications, and it can happen at any age. So you should watch out for your patients um, with um, brain abscesses. So usually they will do a lumbar puncture to isolate the particular organism that is causing the abscess so that they can know the particular uh, antibiotic to use. Then you can do a CT scan or MRI to help to diagnose better. And so if you have infections like ear infections, you don't treat it well. The sinuses, you don't treat it well. Dental, you don't treat it well. These can move to the brain and um, localize or colonize a portion and cause a brain abscess. So when you have any of these infections, be it yourself, your relatives, your patients, make sure that the right treatment is given because of a potential of causing brain abscess along the line. Now, for brain abscess patients, they have headache, they can have edema, they can have weakness, vision problems, some of them fits, and most of them become unconscious. So I just mentioned some of the investigations that we do to diagnose already, and I also mentioned the fact that you give antibiotics and then the surgeon can go and aspirate the pus from the brain and they add um, other corticosteroids and anti-epileptic or seizure drugs to add to the antibiotics that they give. But note that most of these expensive antibiotics are not covered under the health insurance. So you should explain these to the patients and their relatives so that they will try to buy the drugs for their patients. Now, in terms of the nursing care, you see, I mentioned that a person can become unconscious. So you can't leave out neurological assessments. I mentioned that a person cannot do anything. So if you become unconscious, personal hygiene, NG2 feeding, IV fluids, elimination. So you see surgery. You can copy and paste, and it should still fit. So when you are doing a particular system, know the critical things about that system and apply it. So you don't need to chew and learn plenty. No, no. Learn the critical things, the things that are new and specific for a particular thing. And you use the knowledge that you know for the general to apply. So for this person with brain abscess, what we have discussed already fits the cup very, very easily.